let me ask you, my friend, which part of the brain do you want your customers to be using when buying art? You know the answer? Yeah, it's the feeling part of the brain. It's the Inspiration Place podcast with artist Miriam Shulman. Welcome to the Inspiration Place podcast, an art world insider podcast for artists by an artist, where each week we go behind the scenes to uncover the perspiration and inspiration behind the art. And now, your host, Miriam Shulman. Well, hello, this is Miriam Shulman, your curator of inspiration and host of the Inspiration Place podcast. Today, we're talking all about pricing your art. But before we get into today's episode, I just wanted to ask you to do me a little favor. Because my mission is to help as many artists as I possibly can, and the best way I help artists is with this free podcast. Would you take the time to share this episode with a friend? No matter how many artists you know, whether that's a lot of artists or just a few, I bet you know at least one person who hasn't heard about the show. And I'd be so grateful. And I bet your friend will be as well. Now, if you're not sure who listens or not, you can always take a screenshot of this on your phone and share that in your Instagram stories. Okay, now on with the show. Today, we're going to talk about whether or not you should round your prices. Now, rounded pricing is called prestige pricing. And this is going to apply to not just artwork, but also art classes or services. And the other way to price is with the 99 or 97 at the end. So what we're talking about today is actually one of the 12 lessons that will be inside my book, Artpreneur. However, since the book will not come out until, oh my God, 2023, that's right, not until next year, I didn't want to make you wait a whole year. So we're going into one of these lessons in today's episode. Now, inside my Artist Incubator program, they get actually all 12 of the lessons. You can join the incubator in one of two tracks. So the two tracks are the mastermind track and the self-study track. The mastermind track is where you get the most coaching with me. That track is by application only. I keep the size limited to make sure that I can serve the artists in the group. And it's definitely not for beginners. You do need to have a track record of sales and you already need a website in order to qualify. As of this recording, there are two spots available in the mastermind, but when those fill, the next opening won't be until May. If you're interested in joining the mastermind to see if you qualify, go to shulmanart.com forward slash biz. That's as in the letter B is in boy, I is in ice cream, Z as in zebra. We'll also have this linked inside the show notes. So that's shulmanart.com forward slash biz or B-I-Z. By the way, I also offer a second track of the Artist Incubator and that opens up periodically. There is a little less handholding in there, but you get it for a much lower investment. It includes all the same curriculum You also get all the wonderful mindset coaching from our resident mind coach, and you still get coaching by me once a month. So you can read all about that track also and add yourself to the wait list again on the biz page. So that's shulmanart.com forward slash biz. All right. So the lesson we're focusing on today is number nine, symbols and decimal points matter. Have you ever noticed that when you go to a fancy restaurant, they always round the prices? In fact, sometimes they don't even use the dollar symbol on the menu. Or if you're in a different country, the the pound symbol or the shekel symbol. Now, researchers from the Cornell Hotel School found that people given a menu without dollar signs spent significantly more 
than those who received a menu with them. This is because when you don't have the dollar sign on it, it reduces the transactional experience of the number. You stop thinking of the number as money. So here is how I use that logic in my own business. When I am messaging or emailing or whatever it is back and forth with a customer and I'm asked to quote numbers online, I will leave the dollar symbol off. And also, if it makes sense, the commas. For example, if a painting is dollar two comma zero 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 two thousand dollars, I will quote the price to my customers as two thousand no comma or two thousand USD or two K. And this is not about deceiving anybody. So it's not about tricking or deceiving. It's just about reducing the idea that this is just going to be a transactional experience. You're focusing more on the experience or the relationship of the experience or the emotions of the experience. Now, recently, I noticed that Pottery Barn does this too. I've been a little bit obsessed with decorating YouTube videos. And there's a popular YouTuber I follow quite a few, and I'm not going to tell you which one this is, but they and they all pretty much do the same thing. By the way, they they do a lot of shopping videos. They take you into stores. This one took us into West Elm and Pottery Barn, and they show you what they like in the stores. And this particular YouTuber was showing us something in Pottery Barn, and she turned over the price tag to show it to us. And this was actually priced as a two nine nine but there was no dollar sign on it. So it was Pottery Barn, 299, and there was a decimal point, but no dollar sign. I was like, huh, very interesting. I'm going to have to go to my local mall and check out the Pottery Barn and see if they are doing that across the board on all their things. And I'm going to also check to see if they use commas, if things are more than $1,000. Now, When I'm using online art classes, I actually do not round the numbers. I use what's known as charm pricing. This is the practice of reducing the price to just under the threshold of commonly recognized pricing tiers. For example, I offer my Watercolor Portrait Academy class at $497 because art students are more price sensitive and this way they perceive the price as a number in the 400s. I also avoid using numbers that end in a nine. So I, I make it 497, not 499. Numbers that end in a nine are gonna signal value rather than quality. Ending the number with a seven or a five is going to feel friendlier. There's a lot of psychology that backs this up. On the other hand, when I sell my paintings, I don't use charm pricing. I use a round number. So for example, I'll price a painting at either $480 or $500. I don't do the 499 or the 497. Now, the rounded number is known as prestige pricing. I want to share with you some research that backs this up. There's a 2015 research study by Kwanji Jang and Monica Wadwa, and they proved that rounded numbers are processed by the feeling part of the brain. Whereas non-rounded numbers or those using the charm pricing, like the 497, are processed by the logical part of the brain. Their research showed that consumers were more inclined to buy a bottle of champagne when it was priced at $40 rather than $39.72 or $40.28. Let me ask you, my friend, which part of the brain do you want your customers to be using when buying art? You know the answer? Yeah, it's the feeling part of the brain. 
Now, when I used to sell my art on eBay, they actually advised sellers to price past the decimal point. In other words, 499.99. They said that would increase sales. And that's because eBay attracts bargain hunters. You'll notice that places like Walmart also price their offerings to the penny. And the reason they do this is because they're telling their customers that pennies matter. And as a result, they attract penny pinchers. When you're selling art, which is a luxury, you want to do the opposite. You want to repel penny pinchers and communicate quality. That is why I want to share something that portrait photographer Jeffrey Shaw shared with me on my podcast. He was an early guest on the show. It's actually from podcast number three. Here is what he had to say. I think the funnier comparison I love to make is that at restaurants, like you walk into a Greek diner and there's going to be a cash register and a bowl of mints. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. You walk right. into a nice five-star restaurant with linen tablecloths, right? There's, there's a hostess stand. There isn't a cash register. So same thing is true. If you go walk into Walmart, you walk into you know most of your typical department stores, there is a lineup of cash registers. Yet if you go to a high-end store, Bergdorf's and Neiman Marcus, you're hard-pressed to find a register, right? It's going to be discreetly tucked away. Bergdorf Goodman does an amazing job at completely making it impossible to find a cash register. And the difference is that whether you are speaking the language of relational or transactional to your customers. So if you're a very transactional business, and this is the irony of it is that in the middle to lower end market, there's actually more focus on the money. And in the higher end, it's all about the experience and the value. So you don't draw a lot of attention to the transaction of money. Mm. You walk into a Walmart it's obvious that this is going to be a money transaction because it's a very cost-conscious atmosphere, right? You go to Walmart to be conscious of how much money you can save. You go into a place like Bergdorf Goodman, Neiman Marcus, it's what quality can I get? What experience can I have shopping here? And they really minimize the impact of the transactional experience right down to the visual that you can't find or register. Now, if you want to listen to the full episode with Jeffrey Shaw, you can go to episode number three, just scroll all the way down in your podcast app, or go to shulmanart.com forward slash three, and we're going to link that in today's show notes. Now, here's something else I want you to know. So I was working on these lessons in my book about the same time that I was preparing to list my house for sale. So remember I said, I turned my manuscript in to the publisher at the end of December. And in December was when my husband and I were were talking with a real estate agent about what price to list the house. Huge argument, but she really wanted to price our house ending with a 9.9 or a 9.7. And I was not going to go along with it. Actually, I was going to go along with it in the beginning, but I felt really uncomfortable. And before it actually did get listed, I mean, like I would, I'd wake up in the middle of the night, like Miss Clavel, with that something is not right. I woke up in the middle of the night. I said, my husband, there's no way we can price this at 99 or 97. This goes against everything that I've been teaching to my clients and that I practice myself. When it comes to million dollar homes, I'm sure you can guess that mispricing a home can cost you thousands or even hundreds of thousands of dollars. I want to share with you first my agent's logic, and then I'm going to share with you my logic. Now, the truth is my agent's logic would be preferable if it was a buyer's market. But right now, especially in New York, right outside New York City is definitely a seller's market. And that I've heard most of the country is is a seller's market. Even if you have a lot of money, it's very difficult to compete um, for real estate. People, because of the uncertain times, people are holding on to their houses. They don't want to sell. So the inventory is very low and the houses that do come on the market sell very quickly. Now, my agent felt strongly that if we didn't price the home below a threshold, that we were going to miss out 
on buyers who are looking for homes less than that threshold. And my logic is that we wanted to miss out on those buyers who did not have the capital to buy above the asking price. Also, since at the same time we were preparing our home for sale, we were apartment hunting in New York City. And when I was doing my searches, not only did I have an upper limit, an upper threshold, meaning when I typed into Zillow, I didn't want to see homes that were $2 million. So I said, please don't show me homes above a threshold. Actually, my threshold was much lower than $2 million. And I also didn't want to see homes that were lower, priced lower than a threshold, because I didn't want to be bothered with Zillow updates about apartments below a certain price that might be really weird, like it had a bathtub and a kitchen or something like that. I want to share with you one of the apartments we did look at. It was really nice, except for this very weird bathroom situation. Just off the kitchen, it had a toilet with no sink. And then in another bathroom, and I'm going to put bathroom here in air quotes, it had a sink and a shower, but no toilet. And then a third bathroom had A toilet, a sink, and a bathtub, but it had two doors. And yes, this is a million dollar apartment. So I did not want to be bothered with the bottom of the barrel for New York State real estate apartments. And I knew that buyers like myself had the same logic and probably had similar filters for their alerts for homes in my town, and that they also had a bottom threshold. In addition, I understood that pricing the house ending in a 99 or 97 would send a signal that we were open to offers below the asking price. Using a rounded number sent the message that we were looking for asking and above. So what happened? We listed the apartment on the coldest weekend of the year in January. Between Wednesday and that Sunday, over like that four day weekend or five five day period, we had over 90 showings. It was a brutally cold January, perhaps the coldest of the year. And then our house went to what's known in the real estate market as best and final offers. So, what that means is my agent sent an email out to all the agents who had taken their clients to see the home that they had to submit their best and highest offer by noon on Monday. In the end, we received 10 offers and all of them were over the asking price. And the winning bid was 200,000 over the asking price. And by the way, the next lowest was only like a little bit lower than that. Now, this is a seller's market, but I can compare what happened with my house to another home just a few blocks away. And they put their house on the market in early December before the weather got bitterly cold. And there's, they had some features in their house that actually made it worth a little bit more than ours. They had a flat piece of land and our house is on a steep hill. And they did price it ending in a, I think it was a 99. So $1,000 less than ours. And they did not get more lookers on the house. I said, we had over 90 showings. They had 84 showings, still a lot, but not as many as we did. And they did get more bids. They got 14 bids, but some were below the asking price. And their winning bid was $50,000 less than ours. So pricing their house just $1,000 less than ours may have cost them $50,000. $50,000. By the way, if you're enjoying these strategies, my specialty is coaching other artists to take their talent and create a thriving business out of it with practical strategies that go beyond the inspiration shared on this podcast. If you want to profit from your passion or want a clear strategy to ramp up your existing creative business, but you're spinning and don't know what to do next, I can help you. To schedule a free discovery call, all you have to do is sign up at shulmanart.com forward slash biz. 
That's shulmanart.com forward slash B-I-Z. All right, my friends, I hope you got a lot of value out of today's show. Remember, my mission is to help as many artists as possible. So if you got value from today's show, please pay it forward and share it with a friend. That's it for today. I will see you the same place next week. And until next time, stay inspired. Thank you for listening to the Inspiration Place podcast. Connect with us on Facebook at facebook.com slash shulmanart, on Instagram at shulmanart, and of course, on shulmanart.com. 